Welcome, everyone, to this first edition of the Doorstep Podcast for 2024. I'm your co-host, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Council, Nick Gvozdev. And I'm Tatiana Serafin, also Senior Fellow here at Carnegie Council, welcoming you to 2024, Nick, and welcoming in a moment uh, Judah Grunstein, uh, the editor of World Politics Review, who is going to come back and share with us his predictions for 2024 um, and thoughts on what happened in 2023. Uh, before that, I do want to mention a couple of things. Uh, the first is for our audience here, we want you to engage with us. So um, we uh, want you to follow us and our conversation. Nick just wrote a great piece on our work uh, in 2023, visiting college campuses across the country uh, about and learning our learnings about uh, what you're thinking uh, on the ground, um, because that feeds into what we're thinking for 2024. So please uh, email us, find us on Blue Sky, uh, sometimes on Twitter, uh, and share your thoughts. And also, please join us January 31st at 9.30. Um, for our first book talk of the year with Christina Luntz on the future of foreign policy is feminist. It's our first book talk of the year. You can sign up on CarnegieCouncil.org. Uh, we look forward to wel welcoming back Christina Luntz. Uh, we spoke with her last year and um, we are so excited to read her book um, and discuss it with all of you. Um, so please go to CarnegieCouncil.org for information about that book talk and all of the work that we do. And with that, let's go to our conversation with Judah. Judah, thank you so much for joining us uh, at the top of 2024, your fourth year here at the Doorstep Podcast. Um, and I think that gives us a lot of opportunity to talk about what is really happening in this new decade, which is not new anymore, I guess, right? We're in, the, we're, we're in our midlife crisis, I would say. That, that's how I would put it. <laughs> Thank you for joining us so much. Um, again, we look forward to to hearing what you thought about this crazy year, 2023-23, and uh, what we look forward to in 2024. Um, I want to start off with something you recently wrote, because there are so many things we could talk about. Um, I want to start out with this quote, because I think it, it really lays the groundwork for so many threads that we pulled last year um, uh, in, in terms of our discussion. But you wrote, it's fascinating that with all the talk over the past 15 years of the demise of the liberal international order and emergence of a new one, no one has argued that this transformation will almost certainly entail the reconfiguration of various nation states we currently think of as definitive. I love that because it's such a big way to look at all of our Lego block problems that have created this massive, I don't know what. Um, when you wrote that, what were you thinking? All right, well, well first of all, thanks for having <laughs> me. Uh, it's, it's become sort of a New Year's uh, ritual uh, and and over the years, I've started thinking about gathering my thoughts more and more earlier and earlier into December. Um, second of all, I, I need to stop writing because I always get myself in trouble. I write something <laughs> and then people quote it back to me and I think, well, well what did I mean by that? But uh, it's, it's, it's sort of part of my process to, to put out uh, sort of provocations. Um, and then often I'll backfill them myself with arguments. Um, I guess where that came from uh, is uh, the, the course of this past year, uh, I've been reading a couple, a, a few authors, um, Michael Mann in particular and Anthony, Anthony Giddens most recently, um, on the emergence of the nation state um, and the crystallization and consolidation of, of nation states uh, within the international system of nation states. Um, and so it, it sort of had me thinking about a lot of these processes, a lot of the, um, the, the social processes uh, and social conflicts and tensions and, and rivalries, but also the military conflicts and tensions and rivalries um, that shaped uh, both the, the, the sort of internal uh, structuring and, and, and rise of, of national governments and nation states um, and the international system. Um, and so the the second post of that thread that you just 
uh, that you just cited, Tatiana, I, I wrote, I can't think offhand of a historical example where the global order shifted, went from one era to another, where there weren't uh, either combinations of or fracturing of existing nation states um, or, or, na or nations before the, they, they really became nation state systems. And so it just, you know, I, I've been thinking about this idea that we, we think of the nation state as almost like the, the, the teleological end of an evolutionary process. And what my reading this year really kind of reinforced for me is that it's really very contingent on a lot of historical events, uh, happenstance sometimes, or, 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 or flukes. Um, and it, so if it's not an evolutionary process, what makes us think that it's absolutely uh, unchangeable or that it's inevitable that it can't go backward or, or shift or change? Um, so, so that's sort of where that, that thinking came from. Uh, and then, you know, also thinking about the ways in which uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe, the big, th the big uh, sort of challenge for the nation state was going to be the supranational, the post-national uh, order of, of supranational entities like the European Union, um, the African Union, ASEAN, uh, you name it, UNASUR in South America, it was going to be these big regional groupings that were going to replace the nation state. Now, clearly, uh, in a lot of cases, that is absolutely nowhere near to, to being uh, realistic. In the case of the EU, it's, you know, depending on, on where you dial the microscope in, you might see things that resemble a, a sovereign entity and other areas, absolutely not. Anyway, so all of that thinking, why, why, do we, why does it necessarily have to go upward in terms of bigger or post-national, supranational? Um, and, and why can't it go downward in terms of fracturing uh, of states into smaller entities that are nation states or resemble them? Um, and then finally, I'll wrap it up in, uh, a little too late to not be long-winded about it. Um, I think that when you look at a, a lot, both, both the international and the global pressures on nation states right now, primarily in, with regard to war, uh, conflict and armed conflict and, uh, and tensions of that, of that nature. And then you look on the ground at uh, various nation states and you see how the very foundation of the nation is being contested in terms of all these identitarian movements and, um, and very divisive debates over who claims to speak for a national identity um, it just seems like the nation state has a lot of pressure, is, is under a lot of pressure right now. Um, and, and what does that mean uh, as we move forward into what we're going to be talking about uh, with regard to the entities that, that exercise sovereignty and what sovereignty will look like uh, in the next, probably not in the next year, but over the course of years to come. Yeah. Well, Judah, as, as you were making your comments, I mean, I couldn't help but think about what has really changed over the last 15 years in terms of what we discuss, what we look at. Uh, 15 years ago, we did talk about blue states and red states in the United States, but we didn't talk about anything like a great divorce, which you've now uh, has begun to seep into the mainstream, as you said, as people start to say, uh, you know, do we identify with our fellow citizens within this construct of the nation state as the border uh, as they've been defined? Uh, and certainly the, the technological shifts over the last uh, several decades, uh, which really uh, accompany this decentralization, the ability that you can decentralize, you can do things uh, at a local level where you can bring down to lower levels uh, technologies and capabilities that before were only in the hands of centralized uh, nation states. Uh, from your perch in Europe, uh, and as you said, that the trend line was the idea that we were moving towards uh, a united Europe uh, that would function essentially as a supranational entity. Uh, we've seen the political challenges uh, in recent years. We've seen the challenges within European states. Uh, what's your sense about how this the technological shift, uh, which allows for things to be done at the local level, 
how is that uh, connecting with these political, ideological, identitarian trends that you're noting uh, that uh, push towards uh, the potential fracturing uh, of large uh, nation states? So in, in the UK, the obvious parallel is um, the pressure on the United Kingdom uh, that's been brought to bear since Brexit, uh, most notably and visibly with, with regard to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, but also Scotland was not at all uh, thrilled with Brexit, very pro-Brexit, uh, pro-EU sentiment in Scotland. Um, in fact, most of the Brexit vote was in England, as I understand. And so there's been a lot of a lot of pressure on the UK as a as a as a, a, a cohesive uh, nation state or or state of nations, really. Um, and and there's been talk that uh, that King Charles might be the last king of the United Kingdom because of because of those tensions. Um, so I think when when you look at technology, it's it's a double-edged sword, and and I think I want to I want to sort of throw in right now from the get-go, everything is sort of a double-edged sword. Yeah. So some of these pressures are pressures that are very uh, divisive for nation states, but at the same time they they have aspects that 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 kind of demand the the kind of cohesion um, and power that only a nation state can exercise. So with regard to the technological aspects. Um, one of the things that the nation state that makes the nation state possible and then the nation state uses to, to replicate itself is the, 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 the sort of administrative power of surveillance, which is from Giddens uh, straight out, no plagiarizing. I'm, I'm making my citation right now. <laughs> um, and he kind of lifts it from, uh, from Foucault, obviously. Uh, but, but his point is that as a centralized authority knows more about what's going on, it can then use that information to adapt its, its administrative bureaucracies better, to expand its power, but also improve its services, um, most notably in the economic sphere, but also in terms of social demographics and things like that. Um, I think when, it, when you look at the kind of power, uh, uh, administrative power and surveillance power uh, I think that's what you're really talking about, Nick, is that those kind of things uh, are either filtering upward to major corporations, big tech. Uh, Google probably right now has more uh, surveillance and information uh, authority and disciplinary authority authority in, in Foucaultian terms uh, than a lot of nation states. Um, but also filtering downward because a local government can keep just as close tabs on on its uh, its population, its inhabitants as as a as a distant central government can. Um, where does that balance of power end up? I think it's sort of like a cat and, cat and mouse game. Um, you know, another iteration is the surveillance power of states versus the power, the organizing power that the internet offers to social movements and political movements. Um, you know, we saw that in, in the Arab uprisings in 2011. Everyone was sure that now uh, no government was safe from the organizing power and mobilizing power of social media. And uh, things looked obviously a lot differently uh, once once states kind of clued in and, and figured out how to keep tabs on all that. So, um, so I, you know, I do think that um, in Europe you have uh, you have similar social tensions going on. Uh, the urban rural or urban agricultural, uh, where you have uh, urban centers very much uh, have very different interests than peri-urban and then the agricultural sectors. And you see that in Germany this week, uh, in the Netherlands uh, more recently, or, or uh, a little further back. Um, and so that kind of maps onto it, uh, the, the same kind of nationalist identity or nativist identity movements are, are, are pretty strong in Europe. Um, and at the same time, you have separatist movements in Catalonia, which has been weakened, but hasn't disappeared. I mentioned the UK. Um, I think, uh, I think it all, uh, and this is just in the, in the core, right. Of, uh, you know, when you think of the core and the periphery, um, when you look outside of Europe in the U S um, and you look at things like, um, 
uh, most recently this, this port deal between Ethiopia and Somaliland, uh, a quasi state breakaway region from Somalia that has, if, if you closed, if, if all you could do was uh, define the features of a nation state, Somaliland is a nation state. Um, it's just one that's not recognized by any other nation state. Uh, and so all of a sudden, Ethiopia needs a port deal, uh, uh, ocean access. They offer recognition in return for a port. Uh, everyone's happy except Somalia. And these are the kinds of things that, these are the kinds of pressures, I think, that can kind of bubble up and, 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 and poke out uh, in ways that with all the bandwidth being soaked up by the war in Ukraine and now the, the, the war in Gaza, uh, there's not a whole lot of bandwidth to deal with it. And so, um, uh, you know, I think that it's, I think it's a, mis a mistake, especially now, to think that these issues, that we can just keep our eye on Europe and the U.S. or on the core uh, and not think about what's happening elsewhere in the world in terms of these pressures, because, um, I mean, and, and this, this can get us into the, uh, looking at the United Nations and, and, and what's happened there, but one of the defining features of nation states is that they recognize each other. Uh, you can't have a nation state in a system that's not made up of other nation states. Uh, so, you know, as, as bad as it is for uh, in a system of nation states to be Somaliland and not be recognized, it's not much better to be the one nation state and there's no other nation states to recognize you. Uh, so if you have a, a, a global order that's really eroding and, and in, in massive turmoil, it puts everything under pressure in the, in, in the ways that we just talked about. Yeah, I, I, now that you're talking about this fracturing, I'm going to uh, tie it into um, something else that you wrote, <laughs> because I think it's connected. Um, <laughs> no, it's all good stuff. I love reading okay. your um, Everybody go to World Politics Review. Um, uh, but it was this um, this idea of, of fracturing and what it leads to and what it erodes. And with, you know, half of the globe or something like that up for election, right? Is is really the the erosion of the politician a real thing that is part of this fracturing, and then part of what you're writing, quote, there are good reasons to believe we are in for a period in which states and state-supported non-state actors will resort to armed conflict more willingly than in the recent past, um, and is that where the next half of the decade is headed? Um, thoughts. So uh, I'd say that uh, one of the things that I did have on my mind to, to, to mention uh, is that I think that we're in a period of time where it's going to be, it's already difficult and only going to get increasingly difficult to make predictions. Mm. Uh, because when you think of predictions, it's the, the continuation of present trends. Uh, if you think about it like a, a river, it's like, you know, the stream of the river, you know, the course of the river, you can kind of intuit where it's going to go. Um, when you reach a point where the river breaks up into a whole bunch of whirlpools and eddies and things like that, it gets a little more difficult to figure out where the next, uh, where the next, iter what the next evolution or what the next uh, development is going to be. So I definitely think we're in that kind of period. So that's a, a, a caveat. Um, I, I think that the, the, the thing about um, the, 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 the global climate uh, landscape is that nothing we know today can help us predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, but having said that, we're in a landscape and we're in a, 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 a sort of ecosystem that is making it more likely or facilitating the resort to armed conflict. Um, it's shaping conflicts in a way that makes it easier or more likely that they end up in armed conflict rather than uh, negotiations or compromises or brokered solutions. Um, and I and I think that you know there there was a lot of um, there was a lot of backlash against the idea that, for instance, um, the war in Gaza or Hamas, the the attack of Hamas on October seventh. Had anything to do with the global order and the erosion of the the, the international order, and particularly these norms against uh, aggression and, and against uh, armed conflict. 
Um, and the obvious argument is that Hamas was doing, has been doing this for years. There's been years of sporadic conflict between Israel and Hamas. So, so the, 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 my response to that is that it's not that Hamas, de- you, you don't need a smoking gun in terms of like, I, you know, text messages or, or IMs among the Hamas leadership saying, look, China's making inroads in the Middle East. Now's our time to act. Yeah. Uh, you know, that that's not really how this works. However, uh, there have been uh, there, there were qu- quoted reporting of Hamas's leadership saying the global environment right now is actually propitious for a strategic breakthrough. Um, and the reason that it's obvious to them is that it's obvious to everyone. Uh, you know, you have the U.S. with its hands full. Uh, trying to keep the the the, the NATO alliance uh, unified and cohesive, trying to keep Europe on board, trying to keep House Republicans on board with supporting uh, Ukraine against Russia, um, while it's also trying to kind of create this coalition to counter China's uh, growing influence. You have China that is, in fact, making inroads into the Middle East and wants to be uh, a bigger actor there. Uh, and you have all these tensions, and then you also have in the immediate run-up, you have in the past two, three years, you have Azerbaijan uh, resorting to force to settle a decades-long uh, con- territorial conflict and dispute. You have Russia in in Ukraine. Um, you have the wars in Ethiopia that no one really cared about, the internal civil wars in Ethiopia uh, that, that really dragged on uh, horrifically for two years in, in Tigray um, and, and are still continuing in other regions. And, and so you have all these things going on where uh, very clearly there's going to be opportunistic uh, actors saying now's our time uh, or states saying, you know what, we're tired of it. We're, gonna, we're, going to, we're going to try to settle this dispute now once and for all. And we see with Venezuela and Guyana, Guyana even though it's very unlikely that Venezuela will, will uh, will will do anything that rash? It's 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 rattling the sabers because it seems to it seems to be what people do now. Um, so so yeah, I do think that those kind of, that the, the the global security order is going to be very increasingly severely strained. Um, and and one of the reasons why is because you know setting aside any sort of utopian uh, retrospective uh, portrayals of the liberal international order. Um, there was a norm toward multilateral uh, peacemaking, multilateral negotiations, uh, a, a real sort of off-ramp to conflict and, and mobilization when it began. The sense that we really have multilateral channels uh, to work with. Um, and in some ways that started breaking down with the war in Syria, the civil war in Syria with regard to Russia's uh, obstructionism. The US, obviously, the, the invasion of Iraq, you can trace it back to that as well. Libya was a little more of a multi multilateral consensus, but clearly overstepped in terms of the mandate, the UN mandate by the, by the Western coalition. So I think that, um, that, that, that what you have is, is a, a vacuum of national or international will capability bandwidth to step in and 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 channel these things away from armed conflict um and and so all of that combined again puts a lot of pressure on on nation states whether nation states that want to swallow up some territory that that they've claimed for a while or smaller states or or nation states that will split off and and divide up or or smaller states that are trying to defend themselves from bigger states so you know all those things there and again nothing is nothing started yesterday this isn't stuff that that just all of a sudden overnight happened but it's a, this accumulation of details and accumulation of 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 factors that i think ends up eventually reaching you know the the the, the famous tipping point or inflection point and then all of a sudden uh, you know the difference of of quantity becomes a difference of quality Jude, i wanted to connect what you just said back to the point about politicians, political leaders. Uh, As you were saying that, I I was thinking that on the one hand, we have some leaders uh, that have just been around forever. So, uh, and in some ways, it's almost like a a time freeze that, uh, you know, 1985, 
uh, Daniel Ortega, 2023-2024, Daniel Ortega, Nicaragua. Uh, Putin has been around now 25 uh, years, uh, running Russia in one form or another. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has been uh, part and parcel of Israeli politics uh, for the last three decades. So you have that factor. You have sort of new generations of leadership uh, and most notably, the announcement uh, that uh, Gabriel Attal will take over as Prime Minister of France uh, to have uh, a younger millennial uh, at the at the head of government of a major state uh, and someone with no memory of the end of the Cold War was uh, a child when 9/11 happened and and the invasion of Iraq. So uh, we have new people moving into power. Uh, that don't have these landmarks, events in their consciousness that I think many of us, particularly Gen Gen X, uh, we have in our uh, lived experience about the, the world. Uh, and also we seem to have, particularly in the United States, but in other countries, a trend towards uh, political leaders uh, who seek uh, to, you know, to run for purposes of you know, it's always been true for politicians, self-aggrandizement, but, uh, you know, really not producing the, the caliber uh, of statesmen and stateswomen that we, we had in the past. Uh, and you were mentioning the U.S. Congress, uh, and you look at uh, the personalities in the U.S. Congress uh, today, uh, and that can, that can raise concern. So maybe bringing it back, you talked a bit about the, the systemic issue, but maybe bringing it back to the personal issue that you know, who's actually in charge uh, in governments around the world and what is that telling us about how we navigate or don't navigate some of the uh, pitfalls that uh, you're outlining? So I, I guess, first of all, I think it's really important to highlight the most outrageous aspect uh, of this sort of boomer generation that hold, hangs on and the millennials that are now taking power, which is that Generation X has been completely leapfrogged in terms of US presidential uh, office, but also leadership elsewhere. So on that level, I think that needs to be said. Generation X has to speak up and, and, and get back in the game. Uh, but more seriously, um, you know, yeah, everything you, you mentioned, um, it, it's, again, it's, it's, almost like, it's almost like a metaphor for the way in which uh, a lot uh, that we're dealing with extremes now in in international politics because you, uh, beyond the people you mentioned, Nick, you have uh, 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 Paul Bia in Cameroon, who I think is well into 40 years in power, uh, most most 70 in uh, in Uganda, uh, Hun Sen in Cambodia just passed things off to his son after 37 years or something. So. Um, and then on the other hand, you have uh, Macron, who is a young president, uh, and now uh, Gabriel Attal, who's the youngest French prime minister, although uh, for, for many reasons, I believe that he, uh, Macron will be pulling the strings on that uh, uh, in, in terms of power. You have uh, Gabriel uh, Boric in Chile, yep. who was the youngest president there when he took office. Um, and so, yeah, you have uh, this older generation uh, that has a ton of experience, and uh, you know, I'm not. It's important not to discount that. We we ran a really good in, a feature article on this. Um, that uh, age age itself is 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 not a reason for uh, you know an elder statesperson to 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 be in office. There's a lot of experience um, and a lot of contacts. Again, the world has changed, so there's aspects where you wonder how how, how, uh, how appropriate that is. Um, and then you have young people with a lot of dynamism and, uh, and and new ideas who aren't so attached to old ways, who are maybe thinking in different, uh, who are not uh, married to the same dichotomies and polar bi bipolar or polar thinking polarities. Um, but again, it's extreme. Uh, you know, you don't have the middle, the middle option, it seems like. Um, and, and I think what's ironic, and, and one of our columnists, James Bosworth, wrote this about Latin American politics, is that when you ask people what they want most, uh, they say they want that middle option. They want moderates. 
But when you look at first round election results, because most of Latin America has the two round presidential systems, when you look at first round presidential results, because oftentimes that moderate option are the establishment parties that everyone's tired of, they get ruled out after the first first round. And that explains why a lot of the second round elections in Latin America are the far right against the extreme left uh, or outside, often outsiders. Um, so what's interesting is that people want one thing and they don't get it. And I think that, um, you know, in terms, I, th I think this is where the personalities and the systems intersect because we've had this whole narrative for a couple of years now, it was central to Biden's administration of democracy versus autocracy. And I think um, what's really important to dial into is how is it that in democracies, people very clearly with regard to polling want one thing and keep getting other things than what they want. Um, and so I think that's something, uh, and, and I think that that's when the personalities kind of win out because you, you know, you get uh, uh, anti-establishment figures, uh, anti-iconoclastic uh, anti figures. Um, I, I'll be honest, I'm of two minds about it. Uh, I, I, I don't like the whole not fit for office uh, argument. Um, you know, when, when you think of the U.S. House of Representatives, for instance, as much as I don't like uh, their politics of a lot of some of the, 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 the sort of flame throwing MAGA Republicans, um, I think that within certain boundaries, uh, it's good to have, uh, to, to question the norms of political discourse and, and political interaction, to be upfront and blunt to bring language that's used colloquially uh, into politics. You see it a lot on social media. Um, the, the, uh, um, the, 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 the progressive Democrat, Democratic, uh, the younger Congress people, I, for, the, I forget the, the, the nickname they have, uh, AOC and- oh, the and squad. The squad. Uh, really, in, in, you know, there was a, a sort of a sense of like, ruffled feathers, but all they did was renovate political language yeah. in a very smart way to my mind. The, the MAGA Republicans maybe in a, a little more of a, of a, a, a cruder way, um, to, to put it diplomatically. But I think that, you know, the idea that you need to, to uh, that you, the idea that the people can't be in politics that that's that's what uh, a lot of the discourse sort of uh, sort of censoring that kind of political behavior to me smacks of, um, and and I kind of like uh, you know mud on the boots uh, in politics. I think that's important, and I think that's how you how you best uh, counter the the idea that uh, that politics and politicians are completely divorced from reality. Um, but I think where the danger is. Uh, is is that and this is again where a lot of these outsiders get uh, are really benefited uh, really benefit and take advantage of is that um, you have uh, and this is in the U.S. it's in Europe it's 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 elsewhere as well uh, they're all corrupt every institution is rotten uh, any and and what you have is any mistake even when it's recognized and corrected is proof that the institution is rotten. Uh, so when a, a mainstream news source corrects an error in a in a news report, it's proof that they're pr they're publishing fake news, uh, and that we can't believe anything they say. Um, and the same thing goes for institutions and and politicians. And so I think that we're and and then you get into the echo chambers of online discourse and and social media. And I think that we're in in a, a very delicate stage and, and period for institutions of the state and states. And, and again, this is more the pressure that they're that they're under um, because uh, it is very easy, it seems, to radicalize people and to get people to 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 believe that everything has to be thrown out and we have to start from scratch. And uh, and so um, and I think that's why you have some of the younger faces coming in and some of the older older faces hanging on for, uh, you know, to, and in, in some ways it degrades the, the democratic 
the, the, the lifeblood of democracy, which is much more than just going to the polls and voting, although that's how it's expressed. Um, so now we come to the famous, what are we looking forward to this year question? I want to say last year, Jita, you said you were looking forward to people going back to snail mail and typewriters, I don't know if you remember, <laughs> and getting off their phones. And I have to tell you, that was true. You were right. You predicted it. I got, I, I mean, I personally am done with Musk and Twitter. And, and as a result, though, I've noticed that I just don't engage in social in the way that I used to last year. I really, truly don't. And I find that my students don't either. And it's, it's super fascinating to me that, you know, maybe we're not using typewriters, like you said, but we are definitely, I think, and, and there's been studies that proven that, that people are just not using social as much as they used to. It's down, engagement is down. People are really looking for people to people connection um, in an in-person connection. And so I find that, that you were right. So, um, so I'm looking forward to your prediction um, this year. Um, and, and Nick, too, I want to hear from, from you. And you've written a lot about some of our work this year, traveling around the country, listening to, to people and their issues. Um, and then I'll go last. <laughs> so well, I, it's funny you say, you say that. But I was going to say, Tatiana, I, I went back over our talk, our, our, our discussion from last year, just to remember what I had said and, and everything. And, you said that 2023 was going to be the year of India. Uh, and I, I'd say, and, and up until about a month or two ago, I was like, man, that was spot on because uh, <laughs> Modi just really racked up the winds in terms of global diplomacy. Got a little tarnished with some of the uh, transnational assassination attempts and yeah. things like that. Um, but, but for the most part, a really, really solid, solid call for 2023. Um, I guess, uh, the, the other thing I, I, I remember discussing, maybe not as my big prediction for 2023, was the, the emergence of, of the Global South um, and, and as, as a, a more vocal and, and powerful actor in global politics. And I think that that sort of did um, play out in 2023 and that, um, that we're going to see that more. Um, and part of it has to do with uh, the recognition in the U.S. and Europe that in order to compete geopolitically with China, uh, there has to be more responsiveness to the needs and grievances of, of the, the global south and global south countries. Um, I think it's going to become uh, a little more um, contentious uh, because I think fundamentally uh, the U.S. The, the West doesn't necessarily have the tools to do so. Uh, and I think of that both in terms of lacking state state backed uh, sort of investment and infrastructure possibilities in terms of only having private sector investment. Um, so I think maybe uh, a, a little even more, and I think the war in Gaza also is, is really uh, creating very deep uh, divisions between the global south and the west and charges of double double standards and hypocrisy between what the west expected of the global south with regard to ukraine the war in ukraine and what it's actually doing with regard to the war in gaza um, and so i think that the 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 global south will continue to play a bigger role but it, that those that that politics will become a little more contentious um, one of the things we flagged in our sort of year in review series uh, that I think is going to be a big story in 2024 is the rising activism, mobilization, and power of organized labor um, in Europe and the U.S. and the West in general, but also elsewhere. I think that the the sort of balance of power between capital and labor has shifted be, uh, again because of electoral politics, uh, Biden's famous uh, foreign policy for the middle class, which, uh, which, which kind of requires getting, creating the kind of jobs that, that lend themselves to organized labor. Um, and um, I, I think, I, I, I don't know where, how this possibly can get worse, but I believe that immigration uh, and mo mobility 
um, is going to hit some sort of tipping point. Um, I think that the, the, there, there are two things that are sort of in heading for a, a head-on collision. Uh, the first is the, the nationalist and or the nativist backlash against immigration and mobility. Um, and the second is the, the, the really urgent need in developed economies for the, the, the labor, skilled labor, as well as unskilled labor uh, that's desperately trying to make it to, to, the, to, to the developed economies, the countries with the developed economies. I can tell you, for instance, in the UK, the National Health Service, uh, uh, the, the amount of doctors, nurses, skilled staff, technical staff that is, is uh, of uh, immigrant origin or immigrants uh, is enormous, and and that's I think something that uh, that that you'll see playing out. Um, again, those two those two um, political sort of uh, forces colliding, um, and uh, and and I'll say this that 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 demand for labor in the global global north um, is a real double edged sword for the global south because it, it, it results in quite a bit of brain drain uh, and um, and uh, and also a, a exodus of the very the, the biggest capital resource that a lot of global south countries have, which is their demographics, a young demographic um, that 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 has a lot of dynamic qualities and, and aspirations. So um, I think those are the, the sorts of things that will be tracking and um you know and and then also just keeping my eye out uh for this question of the nation state like where what what kind of uh, I, I think I, I mentioned last year um the the idea that as the 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 sort of solidified order crumbles there's more room for green shoots to come up uh, and those can sometimes be bad and sometimes good i i I think I don't want to speak for all of for for both of you, but I think most observers ended 2023 a little more pessimistic than they began it, um, even after 2022. Um, and so I don't know. I, I I like to maintain a sense of optimism because it's just as irrational as pessimism, but uh, a little more reassuring. Um, but uh, I, I, I think that that would be the, the, the sort of most abstract thing I'll be keeping my eyes on is what kind of ideas and what kind of alternatives to what we, to the power centers that we have now uh, in the in national, international system might, might be starting to emerge and, and lay claim to sovereignty. Nick? I would probably echo, I think, almost everything that, that Judah has said. And just to, to uh, maybe put two additional points as we move to 2024. First, this is, of course, a year of elections and leadership transitions uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, that by the end of the year, we may have very different governments in places, very different perspectives. Uh, and so I think that there's a degree of, uh, a high degree of uh, possibility for change. I like, Judah, your metaphor of the green shoots coming up, uh, and we may be seeing some of those by the end of, of 24. Uh, longer term, and I think uh, this goes back to what we did for us in 2023, uh, was the year of uh, engagement, uh, go, taking the doorstep out onto the road uh, to various uh, college campuses. Uh, and one of the things that I think, and it may not, it won't immediately manifest itself next year, but I think part of this transition uh, is that for, for the younger generations, uh, the, the emphasis in foreign policy on security uh, is giving way to an emphasis on sustainability, that uh, it's not going to be about uh, security just in the narrow sense of physical security, military security, but it's about the, the overall sustainability of life and of lifestyle and I think those are going to become defining issues uh, for politics uh, as we move forward. 
Yeah, and I'm going to point people to your piece uh, that you wrote um, on Carnegie Council, Nick, because I thought that that was a great sum up of what we learned when we were on the road. Um, I, and I'm going to say I totally agree. I, I checked off migration, labor movements. Uh, Judah was over two on my list. Um, but what I'm really looking to, and I don't think people are discussing enough, and we had a book talk this year about it, but uh, it called Fire Weather with John Valiant. But it's, it's the uh, extreme weather and how extreme weather is going to impact governments, nations, people on the local level, on a national level. I think nobody's paying attention enough. And I think, uh, you know, we just came through a day where we wreaked havoc across the United States, but Canada had its worst fire year ever. Nobody really talked about it. Um, Europe had terrible fires this summer. Nobody's talking about it. Um, on a local level, weather is what people care about, right? How that impacts your commute, your day, your life, your house flooding, right? Do you have, I mean, I just think that that as a thing is going to be so powerful that people are not, and it impacts migration, right? It impacts so many things. Um, and I think that is my big story, not just for obviously 2024, but going forward, the impact of extreme weather is not really being dealt with, um, in, you know, in politics and business, you know, on, on, on an individual level, like we all think somebody is going to take care of it. Well, who's the somebody? <laughs> who's the somebody that's supposed to take care of it? Um, and that that's what I worry about. Um, and I'm going to end with, I also worry about free speech. Um, Judah, last year you mentioned the, uh, I think you called it the return of the super empowered individual. And I think we've seen the super empowered individuals really put the squeeze, at least in the United States, on speech. Uh, although you can say the same thing of Putin in Russia, right? <laughs> or, or any uh, state that doesn't have free speech. Um, and I really, really worry that if we can't dialogue, we're not going to move forward. And, and this sense of pessimism, uh, I also caught it. I caught pessimism and I'm the least pessimistic person on the planet. I caught it and I caught it because of the decline in, in the ability to speak really. Um, I think that's a, a big concern of mine um, going forward. Um, can, can I just, can I just yeah. add one final optimistic thought? Thank uh, you. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of, we're seeing a lot of, um, we're seeing things that we didn't think we'd see again uh, in terms of discourse, in terms of a lot of isms, in terms of uh, uh, what, you know, tongues unleashed and people uh, sort of norms on acceptable speech, not legal speech or free speech, but what's acceptable in the political, the public political discourse. Uh, and to be explicit, I'm talking about racism, uh, Nazism, fascism. Uh, so, and, and it's really, really very worrisome, obviously, for, for, for obvious reasons. I think that there's a pendulum flow uh, swing about this sort of thing. And it also has been generating a huge amount of mobilization to resist it. Um, and there's often a, a sense of uh, concern the first time these things break through. Uh, I think a lot will play out in November in the US in particular, uh, but it's it, the people are mobilizing. There's a lot of understanding of what's at stake. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, people of goodwill and good faith who might not agree with everything, with each other on everything, but uh, certainly agree on the most important things. Um, and, you know, we just have to hope and, and work to make sure that that's enough to, to sort of uh, to, to get us over this, uh, this rough patch. Thank you so much again for joining us uh, for our fourth year of review and prediction. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure as always.